All right, we're recording. Normally it's automatic, but thank you very much, Uksa. All right, so how's everybody doing? Tell me your terrible questions or worries or fears about this course. Anybody have any questions or fears or worries or anything? Actually, uh, I think, sir, uh, on this initial stages, because we are uh, reading the scholar, scholarly yeah, uh, uh, the writing, so somehow it is difficult, a bit difficult to understand or grasp, grasp the idea. And uh, one more thing is, uh, uh, in our this lecture or the second assignment, necessity and viability of the biblical theology, we have uh, about 13, pap 13 papers. So it's a lot of stuff, material. So we're doing yeah, everything. I now, ah, so, we, so we also need to less the or cut short the papers too. Ah, uh, no, no, you need to learn how to do more. Ah, wow, Zindiki Mushkil hai. Right, Rukhsar, Zindiki Mushkil hai. Ah, so you are now, you are now getting a a Western sort of. Western sort of education. It's difficult, but I promise you that in a regular MPhil course in America, which we would call an MA, in the MA course in America, they would give you way more reading. Way, way more. I've been so kind. To you. So, yes, we need your prayers. Amen, amen. Okay, yes, definitely. Prayer makes that difference. <laughs> yes, the, the book of article, facts. The second article, uh, uh, though it's uh, difficult, but it's very interesting uh, because the writer was pastor, then he completed yeah. his studies, and then. Uh, yeah. But uh, as you have uh, asked in uh, the slides, uh, that when we have to highlight the words, uh, the, uh, these will be with the ratio of uh, sa uh, seven multiplied by two uh, and then plus five. No, it's a number of lines. Number so of lines. That lines. should be yes, sir. Double number of lines. Uh, yeah. Double double, double the number the, of lines. And then, then we add, add five. To five. <clears throat> uh, and sir, uh, in this article, that is second one, uh, uh, it seems that every word is very much important. Ah. Yeah. And and uh, and there are little quotations or uh, when he talk about different ideas. So uh, in uh, sometimes two words together or sometimes in a, in a same sentence, more than uh, five words uh, are, uh, are uh, seems to be uh, more than five words seem to be underlined. So now what uh, uh, what should we do? Right. It's a very important right. article, very interesting. Ah, so, so here's, here's the deal. In six weeks, this will not be a problem for you. Now it is a problem. It is difficult. I understand that. So the deal is you have to choose the best words and the good words you just have to ignore. Because I take off points if you have over the required amount. Yeah, so I do. So uh, somebody had 23, somebody had 33 words, and I, I took off points from that. Somebody had 23 words, there are only supposed to be 19 words. I took off points for that. So you're just going to have to do it. It means that you won't have every single point in that paragraph. You only have the subse sururi points. Subse sururi okay. vala points, I don't know. So you just, you won't have all of them. You just have the most important. And you'll feel like, you'll feel a little frustrated and it'll take you three times as long. But in six weeks, it won't take you three times as long. And in 12 weeks, it'll take you the same amount of time. And then the advantage of doing it this way, and I'm serious, is it forces you to understand the paragraph. So I'm not joking when I say that in six weeks, it will not be so hard. And in, I mean, I can't tell you the person's name, but there was a student last year who did this and handed in the assignment, the first assignment, and almost every word was highlighted. Almost every word, uh, was not highlighted. Like, the law was not highlighted. Like every other word was highlighted. And it was like yellow. 
and it was just like looking at something. It was like looking at a lemon. It was just so yellow. It was just like looking at a lemon. It was like, whoa, where's the... And, and so I said to this person, I gave the person who was not used to getting a grade like this, I gave this person like a D for that assignment. And this person was not angry, but was like panicking. But by the end of the semester, that person was able to do it properly. And then that person took me for another course in the spring semester, well, actually winter semester, and got them all right without a problem. So, oh, 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 and one thing. First assignment that you already did, it's not gonna count against you at all. I'm dropping the grade. Okay, the reason I'm doing that is because half of you didn't do it properly. And so I'm dropping the grade from the first one so it won't count against you. And I will show mercy for the second and third. They will not be weighted as highly as the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th. And you're saying this is too much work. That's, that's a master's program. Go ahead. Yeah, excuse me, sir. As, as you have mentioned <laughs> about the first assignment, uh, most of us uh, only taken that we have to highlight and then rewrite them uh, as a different paragraph uh, with the continuity uh, in that uh, chosen uh, the words that oh. we have chosen. So, third thing, uh, though I have seen in the uh, in the your audio uh, in your video that you have uploaded, but I thought. Uh, it, it's my, the, uh, it was my understanding that uh, as there are no questions at the end, because uh, the courses uh, which we studied in the past, questions are given uh, as the exercise. So as the questions were not there, so I thought that in this assignment, uh, there is no need to mention question. So uh, with this respect, I want to ask that, uh, uh, do we have to uh, generate a question according to our understanding? Ah, yes. And then sort out the main points. Yeah, so that's correct. So you have to generate a question that correctly describes the question that the author is trying to, to answer. Yes, that's correct. A couple of you did that very, very nicely. Um, you, you gave me really good, I mean, several of you did. I was quite impressed. The most important thing is to know what the question is that the article is answering. Because if you think about it, once you know the question he's trying to answer, then when you read each paragraph, you say, oh, he's answering the question by this paragraph. And this is his answer. Oh, he's answering, or well, she is answering by this paragraph and et cetera. See? So yes. So you understand that now. You understand that you'll, it's, it's right in the assignment that you know. Oh, and there's a PowerPoint that I have loaded that explains everything. And also, let me show you. Let me show you. Let's share the screen. Let's share the whole screen. There we go. Uh, okay. Eight minutes, eight minutes. I'm glad you asked these questions. This makes me very happy. It's not very fun for you. Uh, for that matter, it's not very fun for me to have to torture you your first course in the MPhil with all of this. All right, let's go. Okay, now you can see my Moodle, right? Okay, so here we go. Um, there it is. The question's at the main, uh, at the end of your paper, right here. You see them? So you do this, you create what is the main question, what are the main ways, and how well do you think these main points answer the main question? Okay, so this is here for you. Plus, so I, have I have a video. Yes, go ahead. I have one question there. Uh, that uh, in your first question is that what is the main question? Uh, I have realized that when we uh, read the introduction of the you know, paragraph, uh, probably the author is not addressing only the one question. I think that he, uh, in this topic, in the very first topic, he was addressing the three questions. He was answering three questions. So it can be questions instead of question. 
Only one character? No. You may be right. If he's not a good writer, then it, it, you may be right. But it should be questioned. That's a very good... I don't like introductions. That's why I don't have you highlight introductions. Because my experience has been when people write introductions, they're not telling us to make... When I write an introduction, I say, here's the question I'm trying to answer, and here's how I'm going to answer it, and here's my answer. That's my introduction. That's the correct way to write an introduction. Here's the question I'm trying to answer. Here are, um, here are the questions. Here's a question. Here's how I'm going to try to answer it. And here's the answer. That's how you do a proper introduction. I'm right. I know this because I've been doing this for years. But often, most often they don't do that. Most often their introductions are this and that, the other thing. I, so, so don't get your questions from the introduction. Get your questions from the article. So it may mean you need to just go through the article quickly and ask that, or it may be that you don't really know the main question until you've finished all your highlighting. And you look over everything you say, what's the main question this author is trying to answer? Yes, Shakib, it is possible that a bad author will have more than one main question, but not too often. Okay, do you want to say anything about that or do you want to ask something else or? Thank you, sir. Uh, the second question is that maybe, um, uh, you know, that uh, you are saying that uh, some people, you know, uh, they have more highlighted words. So maybe, you know, our counting, uh, li counting lines, you know, uh, can be different from you, you know, that probably we are, if the line is uh, like, uh, uh, it's like, third of the four, you know, this is like, mm -hmm. like a 75%. So we are considering it a full line, you know, so probably you are taking as a half no. of the line. So I take it as a full line. Okay. Full line. Okay. Yeah, I do. That's a great question. Yeah. I take it as a full line. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good point. Yeah. You'll probably hate the color yellow by the time this course is over. I don't know. Okay. Any other questions? Great comments. All questions are good. These questions are very helpful. Any others? No, sir. Um, okay. Golly. Another question is from my side. Sorry. Again, sorry. Sure, do it. That's great. Then, yeah. Then on the third question, you know, uh, when you are saying that um, the uh, to explain uh, the main points, so can we we need to just rephrase what he said in that uh, in the in the paragraph, or we can just take it. Uh, as it uh, written in the document, you know, or in the. Now you got to rephrase it. This is a really good question. I don't want you to copy anything. I want you always to rephrase it in your own words. Um, and let me let me tell you why. And this is true. When when I did that article, I found it difficult to take because he just lists things. You know, he says, oh, there are four ways we do this. There are four, there are five of these, there are two of these. And he lists things. That, that makes it difficult to say, what are, what are the main ways the writer answers this main question? And so I had to really think. And when I thought, I started understanding the article much better. In other words, creating you, in your own words the main ways in which the writer answers this main question creating your own words in that actually forces you to understand the article much better than if you just copy. Copy and pasting, you don't understand anything. You just understand how to copy and paste. So this is a really good question. That's why I'm making you do this because I'm making you, forcing you to understand the article so that you, and by the way, over time, over time, you will find yourself when you read articles automatically looking for the main words in a paragraph, even though you won't highlight them, but you'll automatically do that. And what will happen to you is you'll, you'll start thinking in terms of what is, why does he have this paragraph? What's the point of this paragraph? I think you'll be glad. Like in a year, I think you want to take me out to lunch just to thank me. I like pizza. Just so you know. Other questions? You guys are looking so serious. So, so, we, so, so, so we need to rephrase the headlines as well? Uh, yeah, 
I mean, I don't want you to see the headlines. I mean, I want you to tell me what, tell me what he's saying. I know it's a real pain, isn't it? But you know, you'll thank me. You might take me out for lunch twice. I don't know. It's possible. All right. Yeah, I'm feeling really guilty that you folks are going through so much torture. I, I don't know where the other five people are. That's that's also worrying me. Oh no, wait a minute. Oh, there's Mr. Dowd. He's he's hidden. I wish that this program I could do that and bring all of you in. I just like to see you all. All right, let's get to work. So I was planning on my little computer, but I think this computer is better. It's faster. All right, so OneDrive. Oh no, let's do this. PowerPoint. Any other questions? Okay, I believe you. Sir, I have a question. Good. Uh, sir, is it possible uh, that uh, the creeds that we looked upon uh, previous time, they might have uh, words which may convey a certain thing which is not entirely accurate? Would you say that question again? I didn't understand one word. It was the third, you said, is it possible that the, and I didn't hear sir, that. Uh, sir, uh, uh, I'll, I'll rephrase my question. Is it possible that the creeds we looked upon oh, at yeah, 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 time, uh, uh, they are not inherent? Yes. Yes, okay, yes it you. is possible. It's possible, yeah. So, I can give you an example, but if I do that, it's going to take us 15 minutes because people are going to start asking questions. But if you send me an email, I'll send back my reply to that because yes, it is possible. The creeds are creeds are creeds. The Bible is the Bible. The creeds are not the word of God. However, having said that, I make it my rule and you should make it your rule to be humble enough to realize that the people who put those creeds together are a lot wiser and a lot closer to the New Testament than I am. And so I take what they say, I just do. And I don't think I'm wrong in doing that. But your question is a very, very good question. All right. Well, this is not going the way I was expecting. Let's see, let's see if I can do this. No, 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 that's not what I'm gonna do. I have to find out how to do this, and I do not know. There we go. Okay, I have to make y'all small. Topics in Biblical Theology. I've never understood how to do this. There we go. I'll try this. I don't think it's going to work, though. Well, let's just do this. Okay, we can talk about Biblical Theology from different perspectives. Now, I'm giving you examples. All right, I'm not telling you this is the only way. So these are examples that I'm going to show you, okay? You can do a whole biblical theology. Here's a few examples of a whole biblical theology. God's glory in salvation through judgment, a biblical theology by Dr. James Hamilton. I, I think this is an odd one. I, I don't know. I'm not convinced at all that he's right. But he takes this idea... God's glory and salvation through judgment, and he turns that into a biblical theology of the whole Bible. He said that's what the Bible is really about. I don't think he's right. God's big picture, tracing the root, the, tracing the storyline of the Bible by Juan Roberts. Yeah, I think he does Kingdom of God. If I'm not, if I'm, I can't quite remember. From Eden to New Jerusalem by T. Desmond Alexander. This is an awesome book. This is an awesome book, and you would love it. It's very mind expanding very good his theme for the whole bible is the presence of god and i think he's almost there it's it's pretty good stuff the promised plan of god a biblical theology of old and new testaments by walter c kaiser this is a very 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 good book a little hard to read but a very very good book one of my old professors the most influential biblical theology of the old testament 
or the most biblical, the most influential Old Testament professor for like 20 years. Very influential uh, among evangelicals. Promised plan of God. King and his beauty. Um, uh, Biblical Theology of Old and New Testaments by Thomas Schreiner. Kenneth's professor. And uh, it's good. He does the kingdom of God. He thinks that's the main thing. But he's pretty loose about things. So this is an example of whole biblical theologies. Okay, so I have a question. This is an embarrassing question. I haven't done this lecture before, right? You've never seen this screen, right? Yeah? Yes, sir. Have you seen it? No, you so haven't, haven't seen. Done. Okay, the reason is because this this morning I was it's morning for me. I was thinking, I I have this this PowerPoint and I couldn't find it anywhere. I was like, did I do this? No, I wrote this for this course, as in like I wrote it last week, and then I forgot. Okay, so good. All right, good. Okay, now here we go. Uh, that's that. Whole Bible the biblical theologies usually, but not always, have a few cent one or a few central themes. Kingdom of God, God's glory, promise of redemption, story of redemption, perfection, fall, redemption. Excuse redemption. me, sir. Yes. Sir, how is this different than systematic theology then? Uh, oh, it's very different. Great question. Sir, because uh, then again, they are uh, putting this filter on the Bible and then they are trying to pursue this entire thing through this lens. So according to the definitions you gave us and uh, the way you uh, may, made us understand about systematic theology, uh, it seems a little bit uh, synonymous to it. I agree in many ways. I agree. So that, um, so that what happens when they do this is they kind of have to squeeze things in, you know? They, they can't just they can't just say okay here's the central theme they have to ignore certain books of the Bible because they don't fit into it they don't fit the theme and then they have to often they reinterpret oh, big time they reinterpret books of the Bible because those books don't fit their theme but having said that systematic theology is very different because systematic theology is very philosophical um, this is not philosophical. This is descriptive. So, Mr. Dow, the difference, if you can pick this up, this describes what they think is the main flow of the Bible. And they may be wrong. However, systematic theology doesn't do that at all. Systematic theology takes questions like, what is the Trinity? And they answer the questions by trying to find verses from the Bible. Uh, the question what is the deity of Jesus Christ? Or question, when is Jesus Christ returning? Biblical theologies don't do that. Biblical theologists say, well, I'm going to try to see if I can follow something through, but I totally agree with you. I don't think it works. So you're definitely right about that. Seed, land, and presence. God. <laughs> There's one biblical theology that says, well, my central theme of the Bible is God. Yeah, like, we all knew that. Thank you. What have we learned? Absolutely nothing. God. Okay, yeah. That's like the kids, you know. I don't think they do this in Pakistan, but in America. The correct answer to every Sunday school teacher is Jesus. Who loves us? Jesus. Who cares for us? Jesus. Who protects us? Jesus. Who died for our sins? Jesus. Who's the president of Pakistan? Jesus. No, 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 no. But that's, that's the way it goes because they just, so the same thing with God. God, God, of course, of course. Here's what I like. Genesis 1, 2, and 3 versus Revelation 21 and 22. That's really very profound. When, when you, I, I did a course in the book of Revelation. It was a crazy course, but I loved it. Um, when you look at the book of Revelation, you're, you're going to say, why are there so many themes from the Garden of Eden here? Why is there so much about creation in the book of Revelation? What's going on? I think that God revealed to John the revelation. I think he revealed it to him as a fulfillment of what Genesis prepares us for. That's not bad. 
Not saying that the whole Old Testament does this and the whole New Testament does this, but it is very possible that the whole idea of the Bible is to show us how we get from Genesis to Revelation. I don't know, it's not bad at all. It's a very good book. That's T. Desmond Alexander. Super good book. All right. Usually, I already said this, whole, whole, Bibli whole Bible biblical theologies have a habit of forcing their models on part of the Bible. Let me make you guys smaller again. Pretty hard to figure out how the book of Proverbs as a whole, or the Song of Solomon fits into a biblical theology. That's pretty hard. If they do fit in, it's usually some kind of creation thing, but I'm never impressed. In other words, parts of the Old Testament are not specifically about the story of redemption, right? I mean, Exodus is. Genesis is about redemption. Exodus is about redemption. The Pentateuch is about, I mean, the, the Torah, it's about redemption. Song of Solomon isn't about redemption. Proverbs isn't about redemption. A lot of the Psalms are, but a lot of the Psalms aren't. In other words, parts of the Old Testament are not specifically about the story of redemption, but are about living life practically in the world we received from Adam and Eve. So, Okay, so now that's one kind. I, I, but I, I learn from them, even though I don't trust them. I do learn from them. And so, it's, so I'm not saying throw them out. I'm just saying, but if you write one, I'll read it, I promise, as long as it's in English. There are New Testament theologies and Old Testament theologies. It's somewhat easier to write a New Testament theology than an Old Testament, because the New Testament was written during a short period of time. And all of the New Testament focuses on Jesus Christ, right? What's the subject of the New Testament? Jesus. That's easy. He's everywhere in the New Testament. So he's the subject of the New Testament. That's easy. There's value in comparing the main themes and perspectives of different writers. Let me, let me, no, I, let me, let me just explain a little bit. Uh, let me see if I do explain. No. Doing, doing a New Testament theology, you know, I, I do the theology of Mark. What are the main themes in Mark? And then I do a theology of Luke. What are the main themes in Luke? They're different. They're different from Mark. They, they're not contradictory, but they're different. Mark starts his gospel at the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the Son of God is a really important part of the gospel of Mark. And the, another thing that's really important in the Gospel of Mark is the disciples trying to figure out who Jesus is, and they keep failing. Another thing that's really important in the Gospel of Mark is how Jesus comes to Israel and Israel rejects him. That rejection is really important in the Gospel of Mark. So Jesus Christ is the Son of God is really important. Um, the disciples struggling to figure out who Jesus is is really important, super important in the Gospel of Mark. And I, if we had time, I'd show you, you'd be like amazed. And then thirdly, the, the, how does Israel deal with Jesus? You know, the Pharisees, and it, it, it's, it's, it's in all four Gospels, but in the Gospel of Mark, it's like major. All right, so now I'm going to do a theology of the Gospel of Mark. And I'm going to say, well, these are the themes of, of Mark. And this seems to be what Mark's trying to accomplish. And when I do that, this is the value of doing that. Then when I look at the Gospel of Mark and compare it to the Gospel of Luke, well, the Gospel of Luke, the themes are different. The themes are Jesus as the Messiah. Yeah, absolutely. Jesus as the Son of God. Yes. Um, but also it's the Holy Spirit. Super big theme in the Gospel of Luke is the Holy Spirit. Not a very big theme in the Gospel of Mark. Luke's theology isn't contrary it doesn't contradict mark but he focuses on different issues so you know it's really valuable to do this all the way through the new testament and then to compare these different emphases these different themes and you begin to say i think i see a pattern here and there is a pattern so you can write a new testament biblical theology and it may be mostly comparing, but you may come up to some conclusions too. Doing the theology of the Old Testament is more challenging, but it could possibly work. You know why? Because half of the Old Testament is history. 
and the part of it that's not, just drop the wisdom literature for a minute. So drop Job and Psalms and, and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs. Drop that for a minute. Look at the rest of it. You got, think about this. You've got the history, and then you have the prophets. And the prophets, I think I've already said this once, the prophets are all commentaries on the history. Yeah, they are. They're commentaries on the history. The history is happening, and the prophet Isaiah speaks to the history. I mean, he's living when the history is happening. It's the history of redemption. Yes, absolutely. And Isaiah is saying, here's what we need to understand of what's going on in Israel right now. This is why, this is why the northern kingdom is about to be taken into exile. It's because of their worshiping idols. And Isaiah gives us the theology to explain the history. This is awesome. In other words, we have a story that we follow from the beginning all the way through to returning from the exile. We have the story. And then amazingly, we have a commentary in all of the prophets. Each prophet has a commentary on part of the story. If you read the prophets without the story, well, you won't understand what's going on. When Isaiah wrote, his original readers did know the story. They were living in the story. So they understood what was going on. So when you read Isaiah, you need to be uh, reading it in light of the story because Isaiah won't make sense. He never expected his readers not to know the story because they were living in it. And so then studying Isaiah becomes very rich. But then think about it. It might be possible by looking at how all the prophets comment on the story of redemption, which starts in Genesis and works all the way through to the book of Esther, right? It might be possible if we're studying this long, long story that starts at the beginning with Adam and Eve and then goes to the flood and then goes to Abraham. Wow, what a big story. If we look at the commentary on that story, it might be that we can start to see there are themes that are important in the Old Testament. So it might be possible to do a biblical theology of the Old Testament. There are some very good ones. But the danger is that the writer tries to force every Old Testament book into his system, which is what Mr. Dowd was saying. Yet, there is the theme, the story of redemption. And, and I'm not going to talk about that today. We'll talk about that in a future lecture. I'm sure that there is definitely a theme of the, of the history of redemption because of the way the genealogies are put together. So thus far, there are New Testament theologies and Old Testament theologies. There are whole Bible theologies. Any questions thus far? Okay, we move on. I don't know how you people can do this class at 10.30 at night. Is it 10 30? 10 I don't know how you do it. I go to bed at quarter of nine. And I'm so tired the last hour before I go to bed. It's like, Phew. all right. But I get up at four. All right. Examples of New or Old Testament theologies. I'm going to give you examples. I'm not giving you recommendations. New Testament. Theology of the New Testament by George Eldon Knight. It's old now. It was, built, it was written in 1975, but it's brilliant. It's a very good biblical theology of the New Testament. Very good. And what, what, what George Eldon Ladd does is he describes each, the theology of each writer, and he goes to the individual books. He describes the major theological themes, and he looks for similarities and differences. And it's very well done. Brilliant. It's actually brilliant. New Testament theology by Howard Marshall. That's all right. A New Testament biblical theology by Greg Beale. This is interesting. What Beale does is he says, how does the New Testament use the Old Testament? And by doing that, he's trying to understand the New Testament theology by seeing how the New Testament uses the Old Testament. It's brilliant. It's a really good idea. He's, he's good. He's sharp. Old Testament theology by Bruce Waltke. Ah, that's all right. Dominion Dynasty by William Dempster. Awesome biblical theology. Really well done. Very, very smart. Very sharp. Introduction to Old Testament Theology by John Salheimer. He's good. 
Epic of Eden, it's all right. It's okay. It's not great. There are also theologies about various biblical writers. Hundreds and hundreds of people have written books about Paul's theology. There's so many that it makes no sense to list even examples, but I will say one. And that's by Herman Ritterbots called Paul, Paul, an outline of his theology. Absolutely brilliant. Just breathtakingly brilliant. I read his book. I should read it again. I read his book and I stop at generally at each paragraph. And I think about it and I say, no, I never understood that. And I often will stop and look at the scriptures and be like, this guy's right. He's brilliant. Okay, there's biblical theologies in Luke and Acts, biblical theologies in John's gospel and book, some bi biblical theologies in the Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Job, Isaiah, Minor Prophets, etc. Note, when you get to the point of writing your MPhil thesis, or even if you're writing a book for pastors in Pakistan, you're going to want to find and use some of these biblical theologies because they're going to be helpful for you. Our degree isn't just about Hebrew or Greek. Our degree, our MPhil, is about biblical theology as well. So we're expecting you that when you write your master's thesis, your MPhil thesis, that you're going to include biblical theology as a part of the way you're thinking. I know that we'll have three more courses on biblical theology before this is all over. Another important kind of biblical theology is following important themes. Some key themes. <laughs> You're not going to like this, or maybe you will like this. Here's some key themes. Okay? Is everybody still here? You guys are so quiet. You okay? Yes, sir. How come I can see all the beautiful yes, yes, faces? Yes, but sir. I only see two beautiful faces. I don't know. Oh, there we go. Okay, I was worried. Because I, I know that people eat. Uh, that's fine. I totally, totally embrace that. You know, do it. So if you're going to eat, eat. Koi botany, okay? Kana bohutsururi ha. Tika? I know this. But I just want to make sure that you haven't, like, gone to bed. Okay, back to work. Some key themes. Creation. Um, has anybody done a biblical theology on this? I don't think so. It needs to be done, though. Sin and redemption? Yeah, lots of people do. I've done a biblical theology on that. Very important. History. And I, yeah, I mean, the Bible's filled with history, but what I mean by history is this. How is, the hist how is history used in the Old Testament? How is it used in the New Testament? Um, I know you've already thought about this, but isn't it interesting that when you read the New Testament, it's constantly tying us back to the Old Testament history all over the place. It's like, it's not in every book, but it's in most of the books where the history of the Old Testament, Peter, you read Peter and he goes back to Noah, Sodom and Gomorrah. Paul's everywhere in Paul. Everywhere in Paul, he's going back to the history of the Old Testament. So then you start asking the question, well, how do they use history? Why do they use history in this way? So you could write a biblical theology. It might be a journal article. It might be a whole book. Somebody wrote a, a, a book about it just in the Gospel of John. Exile. So this is a new fad. A fad is when everybody's writing about the same topic. This has become a, something where everybody's writing about Excel. It's an interesting topic. Judgment. I told you about the biblical theology on judgment by James Hamilton. Eschatology. Yeah, that's my favorite. Eschatology is about the coming of the new heavens and the new earth. And eschatology is following how does the Old Testament kind of like prepare the way for the coming of Jesus? And so what's, what's that all about? And so, um, eschatol, I, I, I'm not explaining this. I don't really have time to. The seed. Ooh, that's an interesting topic. Like, yeah. Land and new heavens. Yeah, that's the one. That's the biblical theology I told you about where he, he looks at Eden, Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. And then he looks at Revelation chapters 
21 and 22, he's like, why, are this, why is there so much reflection here? And then what you do is you read every book in the Old Testament, you follow and you say, what does it say about the land? Why is, how do they use the land? How's the land important? It's not always important. Kingdom of God. Lots and lots of people are doing biblical theologies on the kingdom of God. God's people. It's, that's, that, that can be very interesting. Worship, sacrifice, priesthood. That's an interesting biblical theology. Because you know, biblical theology of priesthood is Old Testament and New Testament. And granted, we have way more in the Old Testament. It's the most important topic of all of the laws in the, in the, in the first five books is priesthood, sacrifices. Yeah, very interesting. Prophecy, Holy Spirit. That's an interesting biblical theology. Um, yeah, super interesting. Gordon Fee wrote this on Paul's letters about the Holy Spirit. Super good book. Super, super good book. Messiah, God's word, words, law. What a hard topic. Oh, my gosh. Grace. Yeah, I'd love to read biblical theology on that. Inheritance, nations, mission, proclamation, suffering, wisdom in Christ. Yeah, we need, we need another biblical theology on that. Old versus new, relationship between Old and New Testaments, fulfillment, typology, covenant. So what you might do is you might say, I want to follow this theme all the way through the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. I want to see how different writers or different situations deal with this concept of creation or deal with this concept of priesthood or deal with this concept of suffering. Wouldn't that be interesting? Because you know that Job is not going to be talking about suffering the same way that Psalms is necessarily or that Paul is. So you just follow it all the way through and see if there are differences and also things that are, that are common. This is a great series. Let me put you all in small for a second. This is a great series. Um, this is the New Studies in Biblical Theology. It's, it's um, edited by D.A. Carson. There are 51 books as of now in it, but they add new books, I don't know, maybe five or six every year. Um, some of these titles are awesome titles. You can find all of these online, so don't worry about it. Um, some of these are really, really good. Um, some of them are just very good. And so Carson is not the author of them. He's the one that just, you know, invites people to share on these topics. And people come to him and say, I want to do this topic. Um, a person who does a biblical theology on a theme might be interested in studying one part of the Bible. For example, God's empowering presence. Like I said, that one. Or suffering is participation in Christ, our own dear Dr. Wesley. But Dr. Wesley wrote this book. This is published by Fortress Press, which is one of the big, big publishers of, um, Christ, uh, of theology books, Fortress Press. So this book is really expensive. <laughs> it's super expensive. Like, oh my gosh. Yeah, it's like, I say it's about fifteen thousand rupees. I'm not buying one. I'm not buying one for our, for our libraries because, like, oh my gosh, it's way too much money. And I can't buy one for our library anyway because I'm afraid that termites will get it. Um, Paul and the Gift by John Barclay, super super important biblical theology on Romans and Galatians on the word gift. Seriously, that's all it's about is gift. And it turns out that he talks about grace and. He shows how what gift actually means in Galatians and Romans. Very important book. And then Slave of Christ. Uh, Murray Harris is Dr. Dr. Herb's professor. And Murray Harris is still alive. He's about 90-something, I think. And uh, it's a really, really, really good book about understanding what it means to be a slave of Christ. So he takes one theme. And he looks at the New Testament, and he goes through the whole New Testament on that theme. All right? Uh, or they might take the whole Bible in a theme, like Craig Blomberg does um, Neither Poverty Nor Riches, which is about wealth. 
Um, here's another one. There's another one. How could we do a whole Bible study of a theme? We need to make sure that the theme is in both Old and New Testament. So I was going to do a theme. It was an awesome theme for you guys. I was going to do this theme. We we're going to do it together. It's just not in the Old Testament. I was so disappointed. It's been, I don't know, just like three or four hours. I just combed through the Old Testament trying to find the theme. It just isn't there. It's, it's very big in the New Testament. It's the theme of world, uh, cosmos, and especially Ionos. For those Greek students. This concept of world is really, really, really important in the New Testament. Nobody's done a biblical theology of it, and now I know why, because it's not in the Old Testament at all. It just ain't there. Okay, so there you go. Um, we would, so we'd want to make sure it's in both Old and New, although you can do a New Testament theology of the world, which I'm, the Lord so allows me, I'm going to do that. We would need to examine how the New Testament uses the Old Testament in relationship to this theme, if it's in the Old Testament at all, which it isn't. Promise. <laughs> so Dr. Kaiser does his theology of promise. How does the New Testament use the Old Testament verses about promise? And let's disappear for a minute. If the New Testament doesn't directly use the Old Testament verses and stories in relationship to promise, what does it indirectly do this? Does it allude to it? Why would we even worry about it? Biblical theology is always based in the actual way the Bible is used. So this goes back to Mr. Dow's very insightful observation. This is really important. So if you want to deal with promise, you got to deal with promise the way Paul deals with promise, the way Luke deals with promise, the way Jesus deals with promise, the way Isaiah deals with promise, the way that Genesis deals with promise. You don't deal with promise just by taking Paul's understanding of promise and just doing that through the whole Bible. And they may use this idea very differently from each other. I mean, after all, Genesis is a different culture than Paul. Paul's first century Jews and Greeks. Genesis is 1,400 years before that, and that's a very different culture. And so the concept of promise may be different. So that's what you do in, the, in, in that. So the first, here are your first three questions. Okay, I think we're running out of time. Yeah. So I don't need to follow this one. These are good questions. I'll, I'll post this um, PowerPoint online so you can just look at the PowerPoint. Ah, uh, that's a repeat. I don't know how that happened. Um, I just want to give you my personal opinion. Don't believe me. All of you, stop listening. Okay, don't listen. Covenant. Many theologians see covenant as a key theme of the Bible. All right? Yeah. So lots and lots and lots of theologians say the covenant is the center theme, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so, and, and it makes sense because in, in, the, in the, the, the Torah, Exodus, Leviticus, um, Numbers and Deuteronomy, covenant is very, very important. In the prophets, Covenant is very important in many of the prophets. They talk about Israel breaking God's covenant. Um, it is mentioned somewhat, not too much, but it's mentioned somewhat in the Psalms. All right? So covenant is important in a lot of the Old Testament. How important is it in the New Testament? Does Jesus talk about covenant? When Jesus confronts the leaders of Israel, does he confront them for breaking God's covenant? Never. Jesus never says, you guys are going to be judged by God because you, got, you broke God's covenant. He could have said that. He never says it. Not once. The only time he talks about covenant is, this is the new covenant which is in my blood. Take, uh, drink, in remembrance of me. But, but that's it. He never talks about covenant. He never says, you guys have broken the covenant, or you guys need to go back to the covenant, or you need to fulfill the covenant. He never says that. He never says, you guys are... are under the, the rule of, of Rome because you broke the covenant. Jesus never says that. If covenant is important, why doesn't Jesus ever talk about covenant? Never. Does Paul talk about covenant? Yeah, not too much. Not too much, just a little bit. Hebrews talks about it, but Hebrews talks about it because Hebrews is about the Old Testament. It just isn't there. So when someone takes a theme like this, 
it means that they're going to do what Mr. Dowd was saying. They're going to just squeeze in the books of the Bible that don't talk about covenant and change the New Testament where it doesn't talk about covenant so that they say that it does. So I'm only giving this as an example. It's just my opinion. Don't listen to me. When Jesus calls the common people, I already said this, I already said this. So if Jesus isn't, if it isn't, if it is, if it is not important to Jesus, it's not important. Okay? If it's but not important. I have a question. Please ask. So, uh, just because Jesus did not mention it, why, uh, why do we understand that it is not important? Because we understand that uh, our God is a covenant-making God. Uh, perhaps he did not talk about covenant because we have already broken it or somewhat. And it is God who makes covenant. And uh, so I, I, I'm not uh, saying anything else, just this, that uh, why does it seem that Jesus does not mention covenant that much as we would have expected him to mention he only mentions it once yeah so that makes it very suspicious automatically but yes. here's here's the my point when jesus confronts people he never mentions the covenant when he makes promises about the future he never mentions the covenant when he talks about the fate of israel he never mentions the covenant never if covenant were the main theme now, that, now, now, listen, I'm not saying that covenant is not important in the Old Testament. It is. Um, and if you if we do the Old Testament theology of law, which I'm assuming we're going to do um, next year, if we do that course, which I pray we will be able to, COVID has messed everything up. But when we do that course, you're going to see that covenant is extremely important to understand. But the fact that Jesus never mentions covenant means this is not the central theme of the Bible. And when you ask that same question about Paul and about, except for Hebrews, with Paul and James and Peter and John and Jude, do they talk about covenant? Does Revelation talk about covenant? No. So if covenant is central, why is it that the key books, teachings of Jesus, never mention it? So that's my, that's suspicious to me. Also, even the concept, he doesn't have to use the word, he, doesn't, he can use whatever word he wants. But the concept isn't there. Uh, you don't hear Jesus saying, God made an agreement with you. You broke your agreement. You broke that agreement. And now you are going to be taken into exile again. He never says that. He does say they're going to be taken into exile again. But it's because they're hypocrites because they've broken God's law, not covenant. So that's all I'm saying. Does that make sense to see? The, the deal is, Remember this for the rest of your lives. You don't just look to see how common the theme is. You look to see how that theme is used by a writer. The prophets use covenant as a way to shame Israel to realize that they have not been faithful to God. He shames them before. And, and you think about this. Think about this. How often the prophets will say, all of the nations, you have shamed God before all of the nations by your behaviors because you have broken his covenant. You think about it. That's very common in the Old Testament prophets. So the concept of covenant is so clear, and they use covenant often, the prophets do. But the New Testament, never. It's unimportant. So that's why. I might be wrong. We're going to have to create our own biblical theology. Oh, my gosh, it's late. Okay. Um, for this course, we need to create our own biblical theology as a team. We want to explore a theme which is important, but not central. All right, just an important theme. Each student will be given research tasks, researching the Bible. I think I'm going to have Old Testament team and a New Testament team. And the people who speak Hebrew are in the Old Testament theme. And the people who read Greek are in the New Testament theme. Luke saw you're in the Old Testament. Each student will be given research tasks, researching the Bible, not articles. We won't do articles until we're all done. And the reason I do that is because even though articles are helpful and nice and all of that stuff, I want this exercise to be you 
getting into the Bible and finding answers for yourself. I don't want this to be you listening to what other people have said. That's fine to do that. You do that after you've done your main biblical research. The goal of the project will be that we will gain skills in doing biblical theology. Our plan, create a biblical theology of worship. It's in the Old Testament and it's in the New Testament. It's not a central theme of the Bible. It is not a central theme of the Bible, but it's a real theme. It's a real theme. Starts in Genesis, Genesis chapter 22, when Abraham almost sacrifices Isaac. It goes all the way through the book of Revelation. So it's an important theme, but not a central theme. Our Old Testaments we research. Old Testament, New Testament, New Testament. Now, you Old Testament students have more work to do. Okay? That's rough. I'm sorry about that. But I will help you. I'll be one of you, okay? And I'll help you with this, and I'll give you lots of guidance. Um, and so what you're going to be doing is you're going to be going through the Old Testament and finding out the Old Testament theology of worship. New Testament students, you're going to... You can have, I mean, there are fewer books, so it's going to be easier. But I, I can promise you, the New Testament theology of worship really stretches your brain. So it's not going to be easy. And won't. What's my goal? My goal is that you'll learn how to do biblical theology. So we're going to do it together. Uh, we'll have two teams, no competition. We'll have two teams, and our goal will be every week, not starting next week, but week after, because I need to do a lecture first on how to do this. So I'll do a lecture on how to do this next week. And then the week after, we'll do it every week. A part of your work will be researching in the Bible, not researching articles, researching in the Bible to find passages and looking at those passages. And that's why I want the Hebrew students to do the Old Testament and the Greek students to do the New Testament, because I want you to use your skills in exegesis to figure out what does this mean? Why is this here? Okay. And don't worry. Not one of you is smiling. Oh, that's that's scary. Don't worry. This is not dangerous. We want to know what Jesus and the Old Testament writers mean when they talk about worship. We want to know what it means for a Christian today to worship God. Will we be able to do this in three months? No. No, maybe in three years. It takes a long time to do a biblical theology of the theme. It takes a really long time. Um, but we'll learn from the process. All right, so don't worry. You have no work to do on this this week. Next Thursday, that's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you a lecture on how to do a theme, a subject-based biblical theology, okay? And I'll, te I'll teach you how to do that, and then we'll go from there. Any questions? Mr. Dowd. Sir? Yes. So I have a question. Uh, good. Let Samuel go first. Okay. Samuel. Uh, uh, up till uh, now, we are uh, learning that whenever we are talking about a particular topic or a particular theme, it is it falls in systematic theology. But right now, uh, our next uh, goal is to do a biblical theology of worship, which is a topic. Mm. So, this is, I think, making a little bit of confusion in my mind. You should be confused. And, and that's a really good comment. I'm glad you said that. So uh, <clears throat> the article talks about this. Uh, the article that you highlighted, he does a good job with this too. He gets, does a good job of explaining this. And so um, in the article, he says that a systematic theologian and a biblical theologian can both study a subject. The difference is that when a biblical theologian does it, well, when a systematic theologian does it, and this is what happens. I know I mean, my doctorate's in systematic theology. Um, so I, I, I know that this is the way it works. What a, what a systematic theologian does is he has a topic and he takes all of these verses that he finds in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, and he puts them all there and he takes philosophy, he takes historical theology, he puts all of that stuff together 
And then he says, this is the doctrine of the Bible. But a biblical theologian says, well, this is what we see in Genesis. And this is what we see in Exodus. And this is what we see in Leviticus. And this is what we see in the Zabor. And this is what we see in Isaiah. And what, he, what a biblical theologian does is he recognizes the fact that that theme, first of all, number one, that theme may be different in different writers. Systematic theologians don't do that. Two, not only do, 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 is that a part of it, but let, let's take this uh, theology of worship. We start in Genesis. How much did Adam and Eve know about worship? Nothing. Almost nothing. Now we get to Isaiah. Isaiah. How much did Isaiah know about worship? Tons. Why? Isaiah had all of the Old Testament up to his time. Let me say it again. When I look at Isaiah and I look at what Isaiah says about worship, I'm reading Isaiah in the context of all that he knew. He knew half of the Zabor, probably half of the Zabor. He knew, um, by Isaiah's time, he knew the, the Proverbs, he knew um, the, the Torah, he knew the history, he knew what it, he knew about idolatry. In other words, Adam and Eve knew almost nothing about worship. Noah knew almost nothing about worship. Moses knew some about worship. But by the time we get to Isaiah, he knows a lot about worship. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to trace what Adam knew about worship, what um, Abraham knew about worship. And I'm not going to take what Isaiah knows about worship, and I'm not going to say, this is what Abraham understood about worship. I'm not going to do that because he didn't understand what Isaiah understood because Abraham never read the Zabor. There were no Zabor. There was no temple. There was no tent. There were no priests. There weren't, well, there were priests, but not in the same way. There were no special religion of Israel. All of those things are a part of worship, but Abraham didn't know that because that's long before. Abraham was long before those things happened. So what I do is I read each part of the old testament in light of what they understood at that time they understood everything that went before them and they understood whatever god revealed to them then but i don't interpret what they say based upon what isaiah says or what jesus says or what paul says i base what they say based upon what they know at that point that's the difference between a biblical theology and a systematic theology a systematic theology takes the verses puts all the verses together and takes philosophy, and takes historical theology and says, okay, let's see if we can figure out the doctrine of, of, of worship. It's going to be completely different from this. But a biblical theologian takes it in the order that it happened. And by doing that, you're going to see you have a very different conclusion. Um, did that answer your question? You want to ask a little bit more, Samuel? Uh, sir, it's all right. Answered okay. completely. Thank you. Well, that was a great question. Anybody else? Oh, Mr. Dowd, you were going to ask something. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, one of the reasons that I enrolled myself in the MPhil program was uh, there is a very good faculty available in Foreman Christian College. Uh, I feel that uh, it would be good if we if we can get more of your audience uh, so that we can spend more time asking you questions and other things so in this this one hour per week audience with you is not enough for us mm -hmm. because in my mind i have a lot of questions and after all we are doing theology and that also of mphil so i think uh, there are questions that can take even up to hours and many hours to answer and expound upon. So it seems that it is not enough time for me at least. Okay, so this is what we can do. Um, among all of you, all 10 of you, okay? What I want you to do is on WhatsApp, you take what Mr. Dowd said, remember my hours. Okay, so Dean Budget, okay, in the afternoon, that's five o'clock in the morning. All right, I am free from five, my time, American time. I'm free from five o'clock in the morning 
until 10 o'clock at night. No, not 10 o'clock at night, 6.30 at night. I'm free for, for my day. So you figure out what that is in Pakistan. And then what you do is you say, can we organize a time where we can get together once a week and just theology gupshop? There'll be no lecture. Somebody buying something? There's no lecture. All it is is just gupshop, theological gupshop. So theo gup. Theo gup, okay? So, um, can do that, all right? You guys figure it out among yourselves. I will make sure that I am available when you figure out a time. And then just give me two times so that I can choose. Okay? And because I think you're right, I'm very happy with that idea. That's good. Okay? No lecture, no PowerPoint, no plan. You just ask questions and then we can just talk. Okay. I like that. Thank you. But, but, but some my request is that it shouldn't be like 10 in the night. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah. You guys figure it out. It should, I'm not going to figure it, this it out. Should be before, yeah. <laughs> you all talk to each other. That's what that's what what's happens. You just go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And if you don't like that, you don't like the time, you just say, I don't like this time. Um, sub say mushki. I don't know how to say this so well. Time setting goes, goes, goes. You guys pick it up. Any other comments, questions, observations? That's a really interesting. Are you guys hearing this sound like somebody's speaking like this? Yes, sir. There is a lot of noise. Yes, sir. I think it's Ishan Jing. No, it's not. It's like Imran Gill. Yes. Are you being electrocuted right now, Iran? Are you okay? You're not being electrocuted. Because because when I unmute you, listen. Oh, you have to unmute yourself. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, yes, I unmuted myself. Is this what she was saying? Mm, a little bit. Yeah, that's you. You figure it out. Okay. I'm done. This was way too long. I tortured you folks. Jesus is coming back. And that's one of the things you can do. Just skip all your work. Just pray that Jesus comes back before you do. As you wish. Okay? So I'm going to say good night. Or, yeah, good night, because it's, it's nighttime. And Shakib, go to bed. Get some sleep, okay? Thank you, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. <clears throat> okay, God bless you all. Take care. Okay, sir. Bless God bless you. Good night. God is blessing you so, so much. It's a blessing. Okay, goodbye.